Did you ever um, stand up? Do, oh, yeah. I did do stand up. I did it one time in San Francisco, and it was at the heyday of sort of all the Robin Williams, Dana Carvey, San Francisco comedy scene. There was a place called the Holy City Zoo. And I went down there and I said, uh, I have five, they'd let anybody get up. I said, I have about five minutes. And uh, I did my five minutes and then I got off the the stage and the the host said, you know, you were out there for a minute and a half. Oh no. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, oh, yep, I've been there. The guy. Yeah, that's always fun. So yeah, I don't know. It was just too taxing on my oh. psychology and I appreciate what those guys do, I, it, but I, I, it wasn't for me. No, it's gotta be one of the things that I respect the most out of anyone that that uh, is in this business is comedy, like totally. stand-up comedy. You have to have just like a gut of, of steel to get up there and do that. And you're right, like a minute feels like an hour mm -hmm. when you're on stage in front of people trying to deliver a line. Like I, I can't see myself ever trying that. And just audiences react so differently. You know, you get one audience Monday that'll just be rolling on the floor. Do at you do it, it Steve? Yeah. Uh, I, I did it for a little bit, uh -huh. you know, here and there. But yeah, not, it's tough. Yeah, not you know. Oh, not a bunch, you know, but yeah, yeah you know, I, I still do open mic nights, you know, just to, you know, mess yeah. around, try out ideas. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So you didn't, you didn't go to school for writing. Mm -hmm. No. How, how did you, how did you find your, your, your opportunity? Uh, into well, it? I'm going to back up a little bit yeah. and just say, you know, my mother, uh, was an interesting care she was addicted to talk shows late at night she'd smoke and fold laundry on the couch and watch johnny carson and i've been an insomniac since i was about three years old and oh so invariably <laughs> so invariably i'd end up you know as a as a kid sitting on the couch with my mother at 11 30 at night while she's folding laundry and smoking up a storm watching carson and and i loved it i loved just the way that the, the guests talked to Johnny and and just the whole familiar vibe they had and I was just thinking I don't know what the fuck those guys do but I want to do I want to do what they're doing mm -hmm. I want to have relationships like that I want to know those people that are taking creative risks and stuff like that although I probably didn't put it like that at the time and that honestly that's all I really knew about uh entertainment I didn't even understand that like there was such a thing as somebody that wrote scripts. I thought probably if you asked me, like the actors were just really smart and they showed up and they made shit up. Went to a little bit of college at Sac State, which is a Sacramento State. Oh, which is, you're, so you're yeah. from Sacramento? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I popped around, but yeah. So That's where I, we were set. Yeah. That's where yeah. Even Stevens was set. But you know, I sort of fumbled around there and got a job with a slideshow producer. That felt like show business to me in Sacramento, carrying sandbags in 105 degree heat and oh my God. just, you know, being like that guy. And I started driving trucks and uh, prop trucks and grip trucks and things like that. And I met this guy named Carl Schaefer who created a few TV shows. Mm -hmm. Feel free to Google them. Um, <laughs> and he said, you should be a writer. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> and so then I sort of took it more seriously and wrote a few things and I had pretty immediate success. You know, I read a couple of books back in 1986 when I started. Like there were, you go to the bookstore and there were like three books on screenwriting. I think it was like Sid Field mm -hmm. and there's Art of Dramatic Writing and maybe one other one. Nowadays you go into Barnes and Noble if you can find one and it's like a whole floor. Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyway, so I wrote a couple of things and, and had some quick success and, and uh, and did Carl kind of mentor you through that process then? Uh, I wouldn't call it mentoring. I think he just took me seriously. Yeah. And um, this was back in the day where sort of best idea wins. This is like early 80s in, in a sense of like, nowadays everything's uh, getting shows on the air is all about packaging and, and what resume. What the toy's gonna look like. Yeah, what, yeah and, and just the business part of it. But he was just a young guy from USC who pitched a, an idea to GTG, which was CBS, Grant Tinker's company and CBS. And I was sort of watching that because we were friends and he says, why don't you write the sides? So he sold this pilot TV 101, why don't you write the sides for the actors? And so I did and they were funny and stuff. And there was, there was literally, I wasn't there, but he tells me there was this moment where the, with all the executives and 
Tinker and everybody they, who said, uh, those sides are really good. Who wrote those? Mm. And he says, oh, this guy named Matt Dearborn. And, and so it, at that point, it was easy, easy to get me on staff. Oh, that's awesome. So you're on staff. Yeah, story oh, yeah. story editor on on that show, and oh, then that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the most amazing things about anyone in your life that takes you seriously or believes in you. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take you. much. It just takes one person. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is say it once, sometimes, mm-hmm. and that seed is planted, and you have like now this new confidence in yourself mm-hmm. to keep going in that direction. And that's, you know, that's happened to me in my life with with every stage from, Mm -hmm. you know, I got kicked out of school and never would have gone back to school if it wasn't for my mentor at that time who Mm -hmm. not only said, you really are a dumb Italian, but he also believed that I was, you know, smart enough to that. And and his belief in me is like propelled me from that point forward. But the same thing in acting, it's like one person sees you and and believes in you and Mm -hmm. gives you that confidence to be like, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Matt, I think you were that definitely for me. I don't know how you feel about him, but. Oh God, yeah, it was, you know, I I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have people that believed in me. Right. You know, know, it's it's one of those things, it can't all come from deep within. It's gotta Mm -hmm. have some type of external source for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How important is it to be likable? Because it seems like, forgive me, but I am the only female here, that men in our industry seem to be more sort of like, granted, there's the idea that they're forgiven for more, but rather, my question is, in general, yes, being professional is important. Yes, showing up is is important, right? Knowing your shit. But how important is being likable versus just being authentically maybe who you are, even if it's disagreeable? That's a good question. Mm I, I think it's I, you're talking about for actors because no, I think actors I mean, and writers are a little different, and I think crew people it's a little bit different. And mm-hmm. I'd say the likability factor is kind of important. Forget the genderness of it, mm-hmm. but for a writer, you know, you in TV, you're sitting with them in the room, in the room, and it's it is just a very intimate, intense uh, situation. And if you get a dud in there, oh my God, it can. Not only, not only is it a drag, but it can ruin a, a dynamic. Mm-hmm. I think for actors, it, if you're super talented, there's a lot. Well, I mean, I think we all know this. Like, if there's a difficult actor, but the guy or girl Delivers. can del- bring the goods, yeah. it's like, eh, yeah. you know, it's like this is the price we pay. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that's okay, or do you think like that needs to be sort of? I'd prefer it was the other way, mm-hmm. where everybody was just. I mean, I've worked with actors that bring so much more than their talent like our actual coaches on the floor kind of thing just by the way that they they handle their work ethic yeah. Yeah. it makes everybody's life so much easier well i think it changes the entire i wish i could name names but i i don't really want to go down that road we don't need to <laughs> it's okay yeah. you could talk about how difficult it is to work with me on set it's all right no, no. everybody <laughs> in this table was cinchy and everybody on that show was cinchy shy uh Virtue. What does she mean? Easy. Easy. Really? Easy. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. You, what? You weren't born in the 60s? A cinch. <laughs> it's a cinch. Yes. Yeah. That's so cool. I like that word. You know, you, you so you worked on uh, 90210 uh-huh. as a producer? Yeah. Were you ever on location with the show? Uh, no. Uh, oh, I, yes, I was. I take that back. It's yes, funny. One, one of my earliest experiences with show business was because of 90210. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used to film in, in Altadena. Uh, the house for the family was on right. Altadena Drive, mm-hmm. and it was like half a mile from my house. And so it became, you know, such a, a huge success that kids would line up across yeah. the street whenever they were filming on location for and sure. just waiting for a moment to see any of the stars of the show. Yeah. And there was one day I was walking down just to catch it, like a glimpse of the excitement, and there was this one side of the street that you couldn't walk on because that's where all the trailers were, but I wasn't aware of what was going on, and I was on that side of the street. And then I realized, oh, shit, I'm past the the barricade. I'm, no. And out comes uh, Brian Austin Green out of one of the trailers. Bag. What's that? Bag. Bag? If you're on the a rider Oh, on that's the his show. name, Bag. I got you, got you. We'd, say, well, <laughs> we'd be pitching ideas. What if Bag? That's so funny. <laughs> Brian so Bag Green. comes out of the trailer, and he's he's walking uh, like right right next to me and we get a little hello and I'm probably I don't know 16 at the oh, time yeah. or something like that, and uh, 
it was just very casual and cool. And like all these these kids come, like these girls run across the street to try to get an autograph with him. And of course, everyone's rushing him to set because he has to work. And I understand uh-huh. that now. Uh-huh. But he kind of shunned these kids and like wouldn't sign the autographs because he didn't have time. And again, I understand that when you need it on set, you got to get to set. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I'll never forget the feeling that the look that those kids had yeah. on their face when they got rejected. And I thought to myself, if I were him, I never would have done that. Mm. And well, then, his karma got him in the end with then, his wife, Megan. So. Oh, well, who, who knows what the story is behind <laughs> he, all that? He was actually a nice guy. Thanks so much for watching this clip of the Even More Stevens podcast. For full episodes, check us out on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts.